All right, so <clears throat> we are still in the nervous system with chapter 16, but this is the last chapter of the nervous system. Thank you. So a lot of the beginning of this chapter is going to be review. So quick review. Nervous system had two major divisions. The central nervous system, which consisted of the brain and the spinal cord um, and did the processing. It evaluated, it made decisions. That, that was your central nervous system. Peripheral nervous system was anything not your spinal cord and your brain. So you had two divisions to that. The sensory division, which was basically incoming information, and the motor division, which was outgoing information to get your body to move. In the motor division, we had the somatic nervous system, which was going to be our nervous system that actually was voluntary. I choose when to clean out the litter boxes. I don't wake up in the middle of the night and find myself cleaning out litter boxes. If you do, please move into my house because I will let you clean out my litter boxes. Just letting you know. Um, <clears throat> But then we had the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system, auto means self. So it is self-controlled. The autonomic nervous system was the part of our nervous system that moved things that we are not aware of. For example, my intestines moving. I don't control that. If I did, I would be a lot thinner. And I will say that until the day I die. So, <clears throat> This chapter, this specific chapter, is concerning our autonomic nervous system. So going back, um, peripheral nervous system carries action potentials to and away from the central nervous system. Sensory carries action potentials toward the CNS. Motor carries action potentials away from the CNS. One is going up, one is coming out. The motor division, like I said, we've got two divisions to that. The somatic motor system, again, voluntary, has one neuron whose cell body is going to be in the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. It's going to go all the way out to the effector, okay? And <clears throat> this is carrying action potentials under conscious control. You know you're moving your arm. You know you're moving your leg. The effector for our somatic is always going to be skeletal muscle. Now, something else, it is always excitatory, okay? So somatic nervous system is always going to cause a muscle to contract. When it comes to autonomic, things are a little bit more complicated. Why? Because it's science. We actually have two neurons that are coming from the central nervous system to an effector. So the first cell body is here. The second cell is here, okay? Now, that meeting point where they meet is called a ganglion. We talked about this in AMP1, and I mentioned putting chongos in somebody's hair, putting chonguitos in somebody's hair, and having them all in one row, let's say at shoulder length, and then doing a braid. And the fact that you've got all those chongos in there means that the braid's going to be pretty skinny, kind of bulge out where the chongos are, and then get skinny again where the chongos aren't. Now, the reason that I mention that is because if you think of a classic neuron, you've got this big, huge cell body that has this big width to it, and then you've got the axon that basically doesn't have any width to it at all, right? So when you get to, when you get to this ganglion, that nerve is going to kind of bulge out, and you're going to see this kind of... Um, swollen portion. So going back, this is the ganglion. You have a preganglionic cell, the one before it, and you have a postganglionic cell. The cell body for the preganglionic cell is actually going to be in the lateral gray horn of your spinal cord. Come out through the anterior root and meet up with the secondary neuron or the postganglionic neuron 
at the ganglion. That cell body is actually in the ganglion, which you can see right there, that little circle. And then its axon extends until it gets to the effector. Now, again, these are carrying things that are unconscious to us. Yes, I just ate sweet potatoes with my dinner. I don't know where they are in my digestive system right now. I have no clue. They could be in my stomach. They could be in my intestine. But I don't know. I don't control that. When it comes to effectors, when it comes to the things that get affected by the system, notice that skeletal muscle is not here. You've got smooth muscle, you've got cardiac muscle, and you've got glandular tissue, all of which you don't have personal control over. Now, something else that's different, it can be excitatory or it can be inhibitory. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So ultimately, it kind of just depends on who you're talking to and what the situation is, which I'll explain. <clears throat> This is the same thing we just went through. Here's somatic, here's autonomic, okay? I don't know why that popped up. Go away. And this is exactly what we just went through. It's not any different information, it's just all on the same slide. In the autonomic nervous system, we have three divisions. The sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the enteric. <laughs> Sorry, it's not E, it's C. But I said enteric, so of course I put an E. Sympathetic and parasympathetic are kind of the opposite sides of a coin. When we talked about directional terms, we talked about one going up, one going down, one going in, one going out. <clears throat> sympathetic and parasympathetic are kind of opposite in a way. One makes the heart speed up, the other makes the heart slow down. One makes the stomach activity speed up, the other makes the stomach activity slow down. So when we talk about them, we kind of talk about them um, together in that way. The enteric nervous system is kind of an outlier. And to be honest, <clears throat> people argue as to whether or not to include this here. But let me explain what it is and then I'll explain why we include it. It is a complex network of cell bodies and axons within the wall of your digestive tract. The enteric nervous system controls your digestion. Now, <clears throat> sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. I walk outside and there's a bear in my backyard. Do I really care about digesting the sweet potatoes I had for dinner? No. So when sympathetic gets activated, it basically shuts down enteric. Enteric basically just goes through the window. It doesn't matter right now. I've got a bear in my backyard. I've got to survive that. Whereas parasympathetic, if you want the cutesy name for that, is rest and digest. So the parasympathetic is actually the on switch for the enteric nervous system. When your body is in parasympathetic gear, enteric is going like gangbusters. It's working like crazy. When your body is in sympathetic gear though, and you're in fight or flight, it shuts that down. So because they are so intimately involved with whether or not that division functions or doesn't, um, we include it as part of this. So let's talk about anatomy. As I said, there are three divisions to the ANS, sympathetic, parasympathetic, which when we look at the anatomy, you're going to notice that they're different in their location, um, where the preganglionic cell bodies are, where the autonomic ganglia are. And then we're going to talk about the enteric, which again is considered part of this because they have such a strong effect. So I'm going to flip this down so that I can write on it. <clears throat> Sympathetic nervous system. Remember, we've got the preganglionic cell 
and we've got the postganglionic cell. Ganglionic. Okay. If you look, that preganglionic cell is in the spinal cord for my sympathetic nervous system, also called um, the thoracolumbar because of where it is. It's in the thorax and it's in the lumbar region. So the preganglionic cell body wrong direction. Preganglionic cell body is between That is terrible. Why is it writing like that? Cell body is between between Try again, between T1 and L2. So thoracic vertebra T1 to L2. And you can see, here are the cell bodies, those circles there, okay? I'm going to actually erase that for a second. Ganglion. Where do we meet up with our second cell? Where do we where do we actually see that? Well, on the sympathetic side, we've got this chain ganglia that is literally right next door to our spinal cord. If you look at um an anatomical picture, you'll actually see this on the left and the right hand side of your spinal cord. The other place that they may meet up with are these guys that are kind of outliers. So we've got the chain ganglia or we have the collateral ganglia. Now, what I want you to notice is location. If this is right next door to the spinal cord, how far does this um, preganglionic neuron have to travel? Not far. I mean, it would be like me saying, okay, I'm sitting right next to you. How far do you have to travel to get to me? Not far. So the preganglionic cell, or I should say the preganglionic axon, is actually really short for the most part. Collateral are a little bit different, but for the most part, we're talking about that chain ganglia right next door. Now, what that means though is if I'm here, right next to the spinal cord, and I need to get, let's say, to the heart to affect the heart, what about that postganglionic cell? Is it gonna be long or is it gonna be short? Well, the postganglionic cell or axon is going to have to be long. It has to, especially if its body is located right next to the spinal cord. And let's say for the sake of argument, I've got to get down here to the kidney. That's a really long way to go. <clears throat> Now, switching gears, let's talk about the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic cell can be in one of two places. It can be in the brainstem or it can be in the sacral region. Notice that it doesn't overlap at all with my sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic preganglionic cells are either up here or they're down here. There is nothing in this middle area here, okay? So that's one really huge difference. Where are the ganglion? 
Gang. Ugh. Let's try that again. Ganglion. Well, unlike sympathetic that has that nice chain right next to it, the ganglion for parasympathetic are either near or on top of their target organ. Okay, so if you look, there's my preganglionic cell body. It goes all, well, let me start here. It goes all the way to the trachea, and then there's my second cell. See that? That ganglion is like here, right on top of the organ. So if we're talking about length again, the preganglionic axon is going to have to be really long. That first cell is going to have to be long because I'm going from either the brainstem or the sacral region to an organ somewhere in my body. But the postganglionic cell The one after their meetup is right there. It's literally already on the organ that's the target, so I don't have to make that second cell long. This one can be very short. Even here, if you look down here, here's my preganglionic cell coming all the way to the stomach. There's my postganglionic cell. I can lindo papa just precious, right? You're just tiny. There is no reason for that second cell to be huge and long if I'm already sitting on the target to begin with. So anatomically, those are differences between them. So looking at the sympathetic nervous system and basically going through what we just went through, okay? Hang on a second. Let's do light blue. Okay. Sympathetic nervous system, or there we go, sympathetic nervous system. You've got the chain ganglia right next to the spinal cord right there, or you've got the collateral ganglia that are basically unpaired and usually in the abdominal pelvic cavity, so they're lower, they're in your gut, okay? The preganglionic cell bodies are going to be between T1 and L2, and they're going to exit via the ventral roots, which makes sense. In AP1, we discuss the fact that everything that is outgoing motor information always goes through the front root of your spinal cord. So that makes sense. They exit from the central nervous system using the spinal nerves, using the sympathetic nerves, using the splanic nerves, using um, direct innervation of the adrenal medulla. This one is really unique. Everything else has two cells from central nervous system to effector. This is the only one that doesn't. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the ganglia, we just talked about that. There's chain ganglia along the spinal cord. Um, for both the spinal and sympathetic nerves. So these two are going to be going through those chain ganglia. And then the splanic nerve C here, this is going to be going through or is going to be part of the collateral ganglia. Something interesting, the number of postganglionic neurons for every preganglionic neuron. So how much does this diverge? If I've got one neuron, how many neurons is this actually affecting? Okay. For sympathetic, there's actually a high number of postganglionic for every preganglionic. So there's a lot of divergence there. One cell may activate 20 other cells. Okay. And then we talked about this before, the relative lengths there. We've got short preganglionic cells 
and we've got long postganglionic cells. Okay. Now let's talk about paths. The spinal nerves. Um, the postganglionic cells are not going to be myelinated, thus they're going to be gray matter. Um, the postganglionic cells go through all spinal nerves and project to the skin and the skeletal muscle. So what happens when you go into fight or flight? If you've ever seen anybody truly terrified, they lose all of the color in their face, right? They go pale. And if you're in fight or flight, your skeletal muscle kind of gets an extra shot of blood to go, okay, I'm either going to punch the bear in the face or I'm going to run like a crazy person. So this makes sense. It's projecting where it needs to go. So you've got preganglionic cell. Hang on, let me get a highlighter. I think that'll work better. You've got the preganglionic cell coming out, meeting up at the ganglion, and then the second cell goes out into the body. Okay? And you can see that here. First cell comes out, meets up with the second cell. The second cell goes out through that spinal nerve. Okay? Now, the sympathetic nerves. Um, the postganglionic neurons actually supply the, the organs in your thoracic cavity. So we're talking heart, we're talking lungs, we're talking thymus. Um, and again, it's the same, same um, pattern. You've got the preganglionic cell coming out to the chain ganglia, and then the second cell goes to the effector organ. That doesn't change. The path is a bit different because instead of going out into the body, now we're coming in to the body cavity. So instead of going lateral, you're now going medial. That's the difference. Sympathetic goes toward your organs. Now, the splanic nerves. Um, so the postganglionic extend again to the targets in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we had the spinal nerves going out to the skin and the muscles. We have the sympathetic nerves going to the heart and the lungs and the thoracic cavity. Now with the splanic nerves, we're talking about going into your um, abdomen. So when you look, this is a collateral ganglia. Let me highlight that. It's not in that chain that we see up here, but that nerve goes out, meets up with its second, or I'm sorry, that neuron goes out, meets up with the postganglionic at that um, collateral ganglia, and then goes on to um, affect the viscera, affect your internal abdominal organs. Now, the innervation of the adrenal medulla, this is very, very unique because out of everything, this is the only one that has one direct neuron. So, adrenal gland, what do you think it releases? What does it sound like? Adrenaline. When do you release adrenaline? When you're scared, right? So, there's one neuron here that goes all the way to the adrenal medulla that releases adrenaline. If you go into fight or flight, you need adrenaline quickly. You can't just sit around waiting for adrenaline to happen. So having a direct line into that adrenal medulla actually really makes sense. 